Hi, everybody. This is Philip Shields. This is going to be a shorter message, I hope, but very, very important one as we get ready for Passover in just a few more days. Passover will be here very, very soon. And what will our mindsets be like? I'll tell you this much. For many, many years of doing Passovers, Satan is going to try his best to distract us. And in this message, I'm hoping that all of God's children will unite and defeat Satan's distractions. So hello, everyone. This is Philip Shields. I'm founder and host of Light on the Rock. Thank you for coming. And let others know about our website if uh, you find that you get some food and help from this website. I've taken Passover now for about 49 years, since 1972, a few months after my baptism in late 1971. And every single year, it seems we find ourselves or hearing of other people having all kinds of troubles and distractions and health issues, marital issues, temptation issues, some falling into horrible sins just as we get to Passover. This time of year, I promise you, Satan and his demons love to do everything they can to tempt you into sin, to tempt you to, dis- to be discouraged, to get you distracted and sidetracked till you almost forget Passover's coming up. They'll do their best to help you sin so badly that you might not even feel you can take Passover or you're fighting sin and, and, and just wondering why all this stuff's going on. Then on top of all that, we'll have many, many distractions popping up, things that insist on our attention, which means less attention to Passover and preparing for it and all, all that that means. I'll tell you, for example, in my case, I have just asked well, where I work to just... Um, I have, I can do this. Many of you can't do this, but they give me leads, people I need to call and, and try to get business to them. And I just said, you know what, for the next two or three weeks, I'm going to spend a little time with my brother in California, and then I'll have other things i got to be working on, which is Passover and all that, and getting ready for it mentally. And, and I just said, basically, I want time off for about two or three weeks. And if you can do that, I recommend you do it. So anyway... Um, some of you are distracted by what's happening to our country. Many of you are upset by the mask mandates or those lockdowns or the decisions and the politics going on. Time for us to pull back out of that and, and start looking into this calling we have to be ready for the kingdom of God. But as a result of these distractions, many come to pass over year after year which should be one of the most uplifting and even joyous days of the year, solemn joy, many come dejected, feeling unworthy, feeling unready, feeling unprepared, feeling sad, feeling defeated. It shouldn't be that way. But does that sound familiar? So why am I giving this sermon? Because this year, let's defeat the gates of hell. Okay? The righteous will attack the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. Let's attack the gates of hell. and They they won't stand against the assault of God's children. This year, let's come joyfully to our victory. This, This year, let's come accepting the cleansing of the blood of Christ. Accept it with deep gratitude. Say it in your prayers to God Almighty. Speak it out. Bless him for what he's doing for you. This year, let's come with a proper kind of Passover. So let's, yeah, this year, let's beat the adversary. This year, let's come to Passover and this time not feeling like we're coming to a funeral. Yeah, I know Christ died the following afternoon after we take the Passover. But let's, you know, the anniversary of it. But let's focus on what his death did. His death, he took upon himself and his perfect life. All of your faults, my faults, our sins, our failures. He did it all for us. And all that was put on him. So you and I no longer should feel the weight of all that sin, failures, falling short, disappointments, errors. You no longer should feel unclean. No longer should feel guilty, cut off from God. For Christ took care of all of that. Now, if you're ahead of me now and you're already at that point where you understand that fully, proven by the way you feel as you come to Passover, hallelujah, wonderful. It might be good to listen to a sermon I gave that explains the depth and totality of Christ's sacrifice. 
You could even just type in depth and totality, as long as you can spell all that. Depth and totality of Christ's sacrifice. And uh, because it's much, much more than just taking away our sins. Much more. So this should be a joyous time because in that death, he crushed the head of the serpent. And there's a verse at the end of Romans, at the, at the end of the book that says, and Christ will uh, make us or let us stand on the neck of Satan in the victory. It's near the very last few verses of the, I think it's Romans 16. All the things our sins did were dealt with, were fixed, were nullified by Yeshua. No more guilt. No more wrath of God on us because of our sins. No more death penalty. No more separation from God. The sermon I just mentioned, the depth, the depth and totality of Christ's sacrifice goes into far more depth than that. So we were crucified with Christ. I've got a sermon on that too. And we were buried with him in our baptism. And guess what? We weren't left under the water when you were baptized, but you came back up. You were raised up with Christ, as Romans 6, verses 3 to 6 tell us. And now we're part of his very body. So what does this mean? It means something very few people, I think, that I've talked to in the, among believers will really accept. And yet it's clearly in the Bible. 1 John 4, verses 17 to 19 1 John 4, verses 17 to 19. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I think I have to talk about that sometime soon. Do you feel bold about the day of judgment? John says, yes, we should. Because our sins are washed away and forgiven. Okay, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, First John four seventeen, because as he is, as Christ is, so are we in this world. Do you believe that? Because as he is, so are we in this world. If you really, really understood and believed that verse, You would have incredible joy. You are part of him. You are in him. You are part of his body. It goes on to say, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. But I love the phrase, because as he is, so are we. So God does not see you, as you come to Passover, as you. He sees you as Christ. He sees you as part of his son. He sees you as part of his perfect son. I know we fail. I'll talk about that in a few minutes here. We stumble. We still sin. But as he is, so are we. We are the righteousness of Christ by faith. The righteousness of God bestowed upon us by faith. Many, many people don't accept that. And because of that, they don't enjoy the joy of salvation. When when David sinned horribly by killing Uriah and trying to cover it up, and he did it in such a horrible way, and that's after the adultery and all of that. Part of his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51 was, Restore to me the joy of of your salvation. And I find a lot of believers who claim to be believers and children of God do not have the joy of salvation. Many times I don't. And I have to come back to that, that I'm supposed to be having joy of salvation. Once I've repented and been washed with the blood of Christ, whatever I've done, I should be able to, in faith, receive the joy of salvation. Now, I have a whole sermon on as he is, so are we as well. People just aren't willing to accept that. But either you're in Christ, either you are Christ in a way, or or not. Because of Passover and the resurrections, our lives are no longer our old selves, but Christ himself is now my life, should be now your life. We find that so hard to accept because we still see how we flub up. We still see how we sin. 
even as Paul himself admitted that he still sinned from time to time in Romans 7. But let's read some other verses. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. Set your mind on all what's going on in the world, on all the politics, on all the lockdowns. Set your mind on all the busy things, on Facebook. Set your mind on Instagram. No, 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 no. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. Galatians 2.20 even says that. For I no longer live. I was crucified. I am crucified with Christ. He says in Galatians 2.20. And my life is no longer mine, but Christ's faith in him. And faith in his life being lived in me. He says in Galatians 2.20. Here he says, you died. Colossians 3, verse 3, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are in God the Father because you're in Christ and Christ is in God the Father. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is our life. I hope you're getting that. I hope you're accepting that. And I'm going to talk about a couple of other things that cause us to get down before Passover. We know we still sin. Paul says that. Let's read that. Or let's read the last half of Romans 7, starting in verse 14. And we'll go on into Romans 8, the parts of which are not focused on. Everybody will read Romans 8, 1, Romans 8, uh, uh, 12 and 14 and other verses in there, but they, they skip some of the other ones. Romans seven fourteen to 25, because people don't know how to accept those verses. We know the law is spiritual. Romans seven fourteen, I am carnal. Even Paul says he is carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I want to do, what I will to do, I don't practice it. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Now, verse 17 and verse, uh, what is it? The verse 20, verse 17 and verse 20. I don't hear a lot of sermons on these two verses. I've never heard a sermon on it. I've given one or two on it, but I've never heard a sermon on it. But now he says, when I sin, when I do that which I don't want to do, Romans 7, 17, get this now, look, read it in your own Bible. Now it is no longer I who does it. I'm not the one sinning, he says, but sin that dwells in me. He's saying it's that old self, the old man, he calls it in other places. The former self. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. For the good that I want to do or will to do, I don't do, but the evil I will not to do, that's what I practice. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it, verse 20 says it again, it is no longer I doing it, but sin that dwells in me. Did you get that? When you are in Christ, it's no longer the new you doing the sin. It's the old you. Because Paul explains in other places that there are two natures inside of us still. Are you following that? God sees Christ. So as he is, so are we in this world. First John 4, 17 again. Okay. I then find a law that evil is present with me, the one who wants to do good, who wills to do good. But I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. That's the new self. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You get that? 
with my mind, my new self, I'm serving God's law, but with my carnal old self, the law of sin. So what's going on here? Who is the one sinning? Is it Paul? Paul says, no, it's not me. He says it's still that old nature that still creeps up in, from inside of him. The new creation, Paul, is not the one sinning. That is so hard for some of you listening to this right now to accept. Go back and read and reread and reread and reread it until you can believe it. Paul goes on to explain that those must be stumbles and lapses and not a continuing way of life. As you read on in Romans 8, that those who are living according to the flesh will die and those who live according to the spirit will live. So he says there's one thing to be, to be said about having stumbles, but if you continue in a life and a pattern of a way of life of sin, that is not good. So I'm not condoning that. I'm just reading what Paul's saying. Verse 17 and 20 of Romans 7, I, but now it's no longer I who, who is sinning, but sin that dwells in me. And verse 20, now if I do the things I don't want to do, it's no longer I doing it, but sin that dwells in me. So um, we feel when we sin, oh no, I'm still that horrible person I was before baptism. And if this is your way of life, then yeah, you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. In chapter 8, Paul makes it clear, though, that if we live for the flesh, yeah, we're going to die, but we should be living for the Spirit. But let's go on and read what he says in Romans 8. And if you really do love God, love his law, love his teachings, then something different should be happening. And let's read it now. Romans 8, verses 1 to 4, There is now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, who live not, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those of you with all the modern translations, that whole last half of the verse is missing. But there's no now condemnation if we are in Christ. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending, verse 3 and 4 is not read much in many churches, for what the law could not accomplish, because it's weak through my flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemns sin, Christ did, in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, he sent his son to live the perfect life so that the righteous requirement is fulfilled in us. So that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Let that really sink in, because you're not hearing that in a lot of church services that I, I've listened to. This has everything to do with how we come to faith in God and come to Passover, who gives us his righteousness by faith. The righteousness of God by faith is a crucial piece of understanding if we are to take Passover in the right attitude and frame of mind. And I have many sermons about the righteousness which is by faith, or the righteousness of God. Just type in righteousness. You'll see it come up when you put in the search bar. So when we come under the blood of Passover, the blood cleanses us from all sin. That cleansing is not, is not, get this, just a one-time event. The tense in 1 John 1, 7 is ongoing present tense. It continues to cleanse us, is what the meaning really is. It's, it's present tense. It's not, it doesn't say for the blood of Christ cleansed, past tense, cleansed us. No, the blood of Christ cleanses us. It's an ongoing process. Think of sin, and it's all very important as you come to Passover that you not let Satan discourage you. Think of sin as a cut on your body. Your blood rushes out all the white blood cells, the soldier blood cells to fight that intrusion, that infection, that cut. And many of them die in the battle, and that's where we see pus 
Those are all the dead soldiers, all the white blood cells and the enemy, <laughs> it's all, all of them. But even after the cut, the body continues to fight the intrusion, the infection, just like the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us, continues to cleanse us from all sins. We do have to repent. Uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We do have to repent. But that is an ongoing cleansing that's going on. It's not just a one-time event. So 1 John 1, 7, but we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleansed, no, cleanses us, ongoing present tense, from all sin. The uh, Amplified Bible, from all sin. We, of course, have to repent each time, like I said. But the Amplified Bible, in the last part of verse 7, 1 John 1, 7, says it this way. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, then in parentheses, by erasing the stain of sin, keeping us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestation. That's actually the meaning there, keeping us cleansed. Keeping us cleansed. So even as Paul said, when I sin, it's the old self doing it. It's no longer I who sin, but sin that dwells in me. So now you're hearing a sermon on those verses that you probably never have heard a sermon on Romans 7, 17, and 20. If you have, let me know, and who by. So since we are now in Christ, we have the victory over Satan and should not let him sidetrack us. We are, as Paul puts it, because we are in Christ, we're seated with him in the heavenlies. If you are a fingernail on Christ's body, wherever Christ's body goes, so do you. For that matter, if you're a splinter on his body, wherever he goes, so are you. Where is he right now? He's seated at the right hand of God. So Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, have been saved. Okay, there's lots of verses that talk about it. We are saved, are being saved, have been saved, will be saved. This is one of those that says, have been saved. Someone asks me if I'm saved, I say yes. Some of you believe you're not saved until the resurrection. Well, this says you have been saved. Ephesians 2, verse 5. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How can we come to Passover down if we really understood that we are seated in Christ, beside God the Father, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So how on earth can we come dejected and down? It's because we're not focused on these kinds of verses or you're not hearing it preached. Maybe there's a famine of the hearing of the word. But we're, anyway, but realize we're in a real war in the meantime. The problem is too many believers aren't living like they realize we're in a real war. We don't start the day off like we're in a war. What do I mean by that? Well, how many of you make sure, for example, and if this isn't a habit, it's got to become a habit, that you don't go to the most ferocious battles we were even yet to see without the habit of putting on the armor of God without the habit of constant prayer all through the day, without the habit of on our knees in fervent prayer before our God, first thing and last thing and maybe in the middle if we can, and, and all through the day making contact, making prayer a daily habit on our knees, first thing, head on the ground, head to the carpet, worship with face down once in a while too, all the way down if you can. If you can't do it at your table or seat, if you have arthritis or other pains that prevent you from doing that, God understands. 
Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, that without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Yeshua even said, Jesus even said, I can do nothing by myself without my father. Everything you're seeing seeing me do, everything you're hearing me say, all of that is because I'm abiding in my father and he's abiding in me. So he says, we've got to learn to do the same thing. If the very son of God says that, how much more do we have to learn that habit too? Put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11. The whole armor, put it on. Don't go out there in your underwear. And that's all. You think you're going to win a fight all by yourself? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but then he lists the different kinds of demonic powers out there, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Then he goes on to explain the armor of God in verses 14 to 19, Ephesians 6, verses 14 to 19. And the focus here is the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he's talking here about uh, the fiery arrows, darts, the fiery arrows that come up against us from the wicked one. We're not even aware of fiery arrows being shot at us. Too many times we're not aware. We've got to be aware. We, if you can't get up in time to pray before you have to go to work, then get to bed earlier. I preach to myself too. I find myself staying up late. I've got a friend named Mike who keeps chastising me if I'm still up at midnight or 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. And so uh, we have to go to bed earlier. We have to get up earlier. If the very Son of God said he could do nothing, are you any better than he? John 4, uh, 15, verses 4 and 5. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me. Abide in me, just as the branch cannot bear fruit all by itself. It's got to, you can't have a branch stick out there in the air all by itself and attached to nothing else. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you're sticking on to me, abiding in me, living in me, abide, abode. You live in me. You're staying with me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing, nothing spiritual, nothing. So do whatever you have to do to find the time to do all this. Less Facebook, less news. I'm watching a whole lot less news. It's all the same thing anyway. I'll watch one or two programs as I do other things uh, with the TV on until I hear the news. I might be hearing it as I go for a walk. I might be hearing it as I'm helping Carol clean up the kitchen or something or after dish, after after supper or tidying up and so on. But a lot less news, a lot more time for God. You want to have a wonderful Passover, defeat Satan's attempts, spend much more time in prayer and meditation in the coming days and weeks. Recognize distractions coming your ways. Reschedule things that can be rescheduled. You know, I... I'd ask uh, some tree trimmers to come here, and I thought they were coming like in a couple of weeks, and they showed up yesterday. And um, I should have just said, no, I can't do it today. But anyway, so reschedule things that you can that draw you away from Passover preparation. Even deaths and illnesses. I had to fly to California. My brother's wife died, and he's not well at all himself. Commit them to God. Stay in the battle against Satan's de depressions and discouragements, even doing what you must do to love your brothers and sisters and relatives and those, those suffering. Sure. And realize that in the new covenant, our Passover and night to be observed is not so much about what happened in Exodus 12, which all pictured and pointed to the Messiah. The Red Sea, the little lambs, the coming under the blood, when I see the blood... 
I mean, when you look at Yeshua's Passover, when his what people call the Lord's Supper, he doesn't even. There's no mention of him bringing up Pharaoh or Red Sea or 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 uh, the ten plagues or or any of that. He kept saying over and over, do this in remembrance of me. Because Exodus 12 was pointing to Christ. So in your night to be observed, make sure that you point to Christ. You can talk about Exodus 12. I probably will a little bit. But then make the point that all of this is supposed to point to Christ. Our discussions are more about Yeshua, much less about Moses and the Exodus. And Yeshua has freed us from what the Pharaoh represented, which was Satan. Yeshua's blood frees, frees us from the captivity of sin, like the blood of the lamb freed the firstborn uh, from having to die. Paul quotes in Ephesians 4, verse 8, that Yeshua has led captivity captive. We're victors in him. So focus on Christ. Focus on Christ and the, during the days of Passover and unleavened bread. Focus on Messiah, the true unleavened bread, as you de-leaven. As you're gathering the leaven in your house, think of those leaven pieces of bread you have to get rid of as our old self. Think of that. And so, um, what was I saying here? I had to cough, I'm sorry. We, we can't de-leaven ourselves we can't deleaven ourselves. We cannot any more than you can deleaven a piece of bread. So what do you have to do with that le leavened bread you find or crackers or whatever they are? We have to throw them out. We have to bring in new bread, unleavened bread, fresh bread that pictures Christ, that pictures our new life in Christ. And yes, be examining yourself. And I will too. Repent of the parts of our lives that still reflect the old leavened bread hanging about in our old self. Repent of all that, sure. And commit to a stronger dedication in the coming year to becoming more and more like our, our Yeshua, our Savior. So we let him speak. We let him live. We let him work. We're doing his works. We're doing his will. We're speaking like he would speak in this situation or that one. And where you find yourself acting like the old self, repent immediately. Apologize when you have to to people. Start over. Work towards improvement. Maybe you're not perfect yet. I'm not. But let's work towards improvement. And once more, let's attack the adversary. Attack him. You know what else? Get your sleep. Fatigue makes cowards of us all, is an old saying. Fatigue also uh, makes us much more susceptible to depression, discouragement, uh, falling short of the mark, sin, fatigue. Not a good idea. Get your sleep. Do what you have to do to get more sleep. Make time, find time for priorities with God. Postpone what you can postpone to allow more time for spiritual strength and preparation. I postponed different things uh, uh, leading up to Passover here. I want next week to be largely uh, clear. So do what you need to do to minimize areas of weakness. Alcohol, is that a weakness? Have you gone through the AA program? It's pretty good, actually. And um, do you have alcohol in your, in your lives? If you're an alcoholic? Sexual sins? Well, be focused on the marital fulfillment if you're married. Don't, don't let yourself be weakened. If you don't know what I mean, go back and read 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to, I think, I think it's 8. 1 Corinthians 7, especially the first five or six verses. Render affection to your wife, and she should to you. Vice versa. Don't deprive each other, lest you, be, uh, lest you burn with passion and, and commit sin, Paul says. So do what you need to do. Focus on being expressions of love in all your relationships. Don't get lured into sin by your computer. Whether it's lusting after something you want to buy and you can't afford or whatever it is. Jesus said, take decisive action. I, I'm, I don't know that he really meant if your right hand offends you, really cut it off. But I think he was trying to make the point. 
that don't let any, take whatever action you have to take to overcome the sin, to face it. If there are people that weaken you and help lead you into sin, well, stay away from those people and those places. But let's come ready for Passover. Let's examine ourselves, realize that we still fall short. And when I examine myself before Passover, my conclusions are, wow, thank you, Lord, for your blood that cleanses me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for sending your beloved Son for me and for all of, for all of us. And I realize my conclusion, I'm imperfect, and I repent again of all my sins, but I'm not going to look back. I want to look forward and with great anticipation to seeing you come in glory, Yeshua, with gladness and without fear, but joy. You know what Hebrews 8, 27, 28 says? The first part says it's appointed to men once to die, and after that, the judgment, and everybody knows that part. A lot of people don't know the rest of the verse. To those who eagerly wait for him, those who eagerly wait for him, that's the end of Hebrews 9.28, eagerly wait for him. I'm going to give a sermon soon about the judgment and and, uh, waiting coming into God's presence, and we should not be with fear. Um, He will appear a second time apart from, from sin, including yours, for salvation. To those who eagerly wait for him, Hebrews 9.28, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So when he comes, uh, he's not going to be bringing up my sins because they've all been cast as far as the east is from the west. And they're gone. They're washed away. They're gone. I've examined myself, and boy, my conclusion is, do I ever need the Passover? And I hope you're getting there too. So 1 Corinthians 11:28, let's defeat Satan's attacks on us. Let's make sure he doesn't get us all discouraged and keep us from coming. 1 Corinthians 11:28 says, let someone, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It doesn't say examine yourself and then decide you shouldn't take it. No, it says examine yourself and understand, boy, do I need this Passover. Take the Passover, take the bread, take the wine, wash each other's feet. And when I wash someone's feet, by the way, I'll even tell the person, I see you as cleansed by our master, washed by our master. As I wash your feet, everything's washed away. Let's go on the attack by being strong in the power of Yeshua's might, his might. Let's go on the attack by not falling for Satan's ploys. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. This Passover, we're coming with solemn joy, gratitude, ready to drink of his cup and eat of the unleavened bread, picturing, partaking of him. So have a wonderful, wonderful Passover and days of unleavened bread. And I hope this has been helpful. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for your incredible love for me and all of us, the whole world, for all of us, that you are willing to forgive everybody who will accept your, your, your lamb who died for us, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Thank you for that. Yeshua, thank you. You, were, you are our Passover. Thank you so much. Thank you seems so inadequate, seems to fall far short. But that's all we can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. And help us live a life that shows we do appreciate you so much. And come and live inside of us, come and be in us, change us, transform us, make us like new. Make us be your true brothers and sisters that you, as Hebrews says, you're not ashamed of us. We're we're, uh, so unbelievable, but that's so true. Thank you so much and help us be ready for the Passover and stay away from sin, attack the devil and win. We're going to win by your power in Jesus name, in your name, Yeshua. Amen.